I'm going to go over the uh, question two from the 2017 uh, AP exam, the FRQs. So the first one here says, answer the following questions about the isomers fulminic acid and isocyanic acid. And the fact of the matter is we don't have to understand anything about what those chemicals really are. We're going to look at their structures. So two possible Lewis electron dot diagrams for fulminic acid, HCNO, are shown below. Explain why the diagram on the left is the better representation, so we already know this is the answer, um, for the bonding in fulminic acid, and justify your choice based on formal charges. Well, if we go through here, okay, formal charge, it's a way to go back and figure out which, if we have a couple of structures that follow the rules for doing Lewis structures, how do we tell which one is the better structure? And so formal charge is the charge an atom would have if all the shared electrons were shared equally. So let's say uh, uh, here, hydrogen normally has one valence electron, carbon has four, nitrogen has five, oxygen has six. And that's going to be the same thing over here. Now in this structure, we say, well, hydrogen here, you know, it gets one of these electrons and carbon gets one. Here, carbon gets uh, three, nitrogen gets three, here in this bond, nitrogen gets one, oxygen gets one, and oxygen gets to keep all those electrons that it has that are not shared. So hydrogen, you know, uh, normally has one. It has one in this structure, so that gives it a formal charge of zero. Carbon normally has four. It has one, two, three, four in this structure, so it's got a, a formal charge of zero. Nitrogen normally has five valence electrons, but in this structure it gets one, two, three, four, so it's going to end up with a formal charge of plus one. And oxygen normally has six, but this time it has one, two, three, four, five, six that are not shared, plus one that is shared. So it's going to have seven in this structure, so it has a formal charge of minus one. So those are the formal charges. Same thing over here. Hydrogen has one, so it's zero. Uh, this time carbon has one, two, three that it's sharing, plus two that it's not sharing, so it's five. So that's a formal charge of minus one. Nitrogen is going to share four electrons, no lone pair, so it's minus four, so it has a formal charge of plus one. And oxygen normally has six, and now it does have six, two that it's sharing, two lone pairs, so six minus six, it's zero. Okay, so when you have formal charges that everybody comes out zero, that's usually a pretty good thing. But if there are formal charges, the more electronegative atom is the one that ought to have the negative formal charge. And so oxygen, since it's the more uh, electronegative atom than nitrogen, then it should have the more uh, uh, negative formal charge. In this case here, you know, uh, oxygen is, you know, getting a formal charge of zero, but it's the more electronegative atom. So carbon should not be getting a formal charge of negative. So that's why uh, this is not a great structure. This is the better structure. So formal charge lets us figure out which structure is a little bit better. Okay, for the next part, it says uh, fulminic acid can convert to isocyanic acid according to this equation. Okay, using the Lewis dot electron dot diagrams for fulminic acid and isocyanic acid shown in the boxes above and the table of average bond uh, enthalpies below, determine the value of delta H for the reaction of HCNO to form this. So we want to find a delta H for this reaction is what we're looking for. Well, we can do this with bond energies, and I've redrawn my molecules, okay, over down here, so we can look at the bonds. And now it's just a matter of looking at our charts. So there's an HCN bond, HCN bond, I'm sorry, HC bond, so that's this one, 413, and a CN triple bond, that's this one. And uh, let me go back and do these with the right colors. So HC and CN, and there's an NO single bond, that's this guy. So these are these three values, and we're going to add them together and get 1505. These are kilojoules per mole. And then uh, for the other structure, we have an HC, I mean, it's our HN single bond, 391. We have an NC double bond, and uh, that's this guy, CN. And we have a CO double bond, that's this one. So we have these three values, and we add them together, that's 1751. But here's the situation. 
and that is that these red ones here, okay, these reactant molecules, we, we these numbers here, these enthalpies, are the energy it takes to break a bond. And we really are breaking these bonds. So we're going to use these numbers just as is. We're going to use 1505. But the ones we're here indicating in blue, we're not breaking those bonds, we're making those bonds. So in that case here, we don't want to use these numbers, we want to use the opposite of these numbers. So what we're going to have here is negative 1751. So we can say we are adding 1505 and a negative 1751. Or we can say we are subtracting the bond energies of the products from the bond energies of the reactants. Either way, if we do that correctly, we come up with an answer here of negative 246 okay, kilojoules per mole of a reaction that occurs. And that's our answer for this, okay, negative 246. So back here, the delta H for this reaction is negative 246 kilojoules per mole of a reaction. Now, the, the gradient on this one was two points, and the two points, one, did they, uh, did the students notice subtract this one from this one? Okay, so if you got a positive 246, you got one of the two points. And then if you did it correctly, if you had negative 246, you earned both points. Okay, the next part. Student claims that the delta S for this reaction is really close to zero. Explain why. So, you know, when you were looking at delta S as entropy, then we're looking at for things like phase changes. Okay, so is it going from solid to liquid to gas? Because gas is more disordered than liquid, more disordered than, you know, solid is very, very orderly. Or do we have difference in moles of gas? Okay, difference in the number of moles of gas. So if it goes from, you know, one mole of gas to three moles of gas, that is going to be, uh, you know, increase in entropy. Well, here we have one mole of gas, we have one mole of gas, there's no phase changes, there's no changes in moles of gas, and that is why uh, the delta S is very close to zero. So we're just showing that nothing is happening that would normally change the entropy, that's why entropy is basically zero. Now it says which species, okay, uh, the fulminic acid or the isocyanic acid, is present in higher concentration, okay, who's going to have, we're going to have more of, uh, at equilibrium. So justify your answers in terms of thermodynamic favorability, so that sounds like delta G, and the equilibrium constant. So again, notice here it says two different things, and across the nation, students forgot to talk about both things. So we have delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And in this case here, delta H, we just figured that out, that's the negative 246. And delta S, we just said, you know, that's pretty much zero. So T times delta S is going to be zero. Anyways, the idea is delta G equals delta H. And we know the delta H is negative 246. So the delta G is pretty much negative 246. Now we can kind of calculate that. And we say, well, what that means is negative delta G's, we know that that means we have a product favored reaction. Negative delta G's mean product favored reaction. And product favored means we're going to have a lot of this isocyanic acid. So when this reaction goes, we would expect uh, a lot of uh, isocyanic acid um, will be present in higher concentration. Now, the second part of that is delta G goes along with a uh, K that is greater than 1. Those two things just go together. You just say they go together. And that means if I have a K that's greater than 1, that means we're going to have more products, which is more of the isocyanic acid. For people who like to do little calculations to prove themselves, you know, you can go back and refer to this equation that's given on the equation sheet, you know, and show that if you get a negative delta G, you're going to get a, a K that's greater than 1. Okay, the next part says the ammonium salt of isocyanic acid is a product of the decomposition of urea, represented below, a student studying the decomposition reaction uh, runs the reaction at 90 degrees. The student collects data on the concentration of urea as a function of time, as shown by the data table and the graph below. So it says that the student proposes that the reaction rate, the student proposes that the, rea that the uh, rate law is rate equals K times this, you know, uh, um, urea. 
And what's happening is that, you know, this is a first order uh, rate law. So explain how the data supports this. So why does this support that this is a first order rate law? The little key piece of this you're supposed to know is that first order reactions have a constant half-life. So we can say this guy here is 0.1, half of that is 0.05, and that took 10 hours. So it took 10 hours to drop you know, down to half. Now from 0.05, you drop down to 0.025, and that took another 10 hours. So now we're at 20. And 0.025 drops down to 0 0.0125 in another 10 hours. So we have a constant half-life. We can also see it here. This drops down to half, half of that, and then half of that. And um, that constant half-life is a first-order reaction. So that's what you really want to point to. What uh, people said a lot was if you were to plot the natural log of the concentration versus time, you would get a straight line. If you were to plot the natural log versus time. And that is true if it's first order, but there's no data for that. So if some students went through and actually figured out the natural log, of these concentrations and then plotted it okay on their little paper and then showed that that was a straight line they would get point for that idea but you know if you don't have a plot of natural log you can't say you know that's the way to prove this so you had to go back and talk about the fact that it had a constant half-life and that's what got you the point on uh, number I then Using the proposed rate law and the student's results, determine the value of the rate constant K. Okay, well, what you could do here is if it's a first order, then we have that really nice little uh, special case of first order where the natural log of 2 is equal to K times the half-life, T1 half. And we know that the uh, natural log of 2 is uh, 0.693. So we know the half-life, we know the half-life is 10 hours, and we know this number so we can solve for k. So we just take uh, both sides, divide by 10 hours, and we get 0.693 divided by 10, and that's going to be 0 0.069, okay, and it's hours to the minus 1. So we had to get uh, the value of k, and we had our units, and there we are. Now, if you wanted to, you could go back. Since it's first order, you can grab the first order rate law, uh, integrated rate law from the equation sheet, and then just, you know, take, uh, to say, you know, like these two data values uh, over 10 hours, the time is 10 hours, and calculate uh, k, and you'll get the same thing, okay, again with units. Okay, the last little section of this, it says the student learns that the decomposition reaction was run uh, in the solution with a pH of 13. Briefly describe an experiment, including the initial conditions that you would change and the data you would gather to determine whether the rate of the reaction depends on the concentration of OH-. All you really have to say is run the same reaction, and if you want to go back and talk about it, but, you know, just run the same reaction, do the same things, but just do it at a different pH. So run it all at a pH of 12 instead of a pH of 13. That's all you need. You had to run the same reaction at a different pH, and that's what got you the point on letter F. And that is question two.